We'll now hear from Gloria Zhao from the University of Warwick. Hello, everyone. My name is Gloria. I'm from University of Warwick Diamond Research Group. Today, uh, my topic is the phosphorescence and thermoluminescence in diamond. I know many audience have done quite a lot of work on this uh, phosphorescence in diamond, but I can, it's impossible for me to review all of them in available time. So hopefully we will have a fruitful discussion after this presentation. My presentation includes four sections. Firstly, I will introduce two types of well-known defects which play important role in high pressure, high temperature, uh, phosphor uh, diamond phosphorescence, and the secondly, uh, experimental arrangement we have built at Warwick to study the dynamic and spectral of phosphorescence, thermoluminescence, and photoluminescence in HPHD diamond, CVD diamond, and certain natural diamond. The third part, I will present some early experimental data uh, we have got and also highlight the challenge for the acquisition and fitting of the data. And finally, the future work. Uh, firstly, the substitution nitrogen. Uh, it contributes to the yellow color of diamond. Um, in diamond lattice, when one of the carbon atom is replaced by a nitrogen atom, um, then the substitution of nitrogen defects is formed. Um, is, so, sorry, there is an extra electron of nitrogen compared to the carbon atom is localized in the, uh, in the bonding orbital. Uh, without optical excitation uh, at equilibrium, the substitutional nitrogen is generally uh, states in the uh, neutral charge state. And if the, it absorbs the light of sufficient energy, uh, and the actual electron can be excited to the conduction band, and it becomes the substitutional nitrogen plus. Um, the electron has many different dissertations. For example, it can be retrapped by the uh, nitrogen plus and become nitrogen neutral again. It also can recombine into the nitrogen neutral to create nitrogen minus. And it also can be trapped by some other defect. So both three charge state of the substitutional can exist simultaneously. Um, in terms of the nitrogen neutral, uh, the EPR technique is very sensitive to the uh, to sub PPB concentration of this defect, and it also gives rise to the characteristic fe uh, FTIR features in the one phonon region. Um, the nitrogen plus it has a tachohedral tech symmetry, and it gives rise uh, to these features in the FTIR spectrum. In terms of the nitrogen minus, the lifetime of this defects is really short in the high nitrogen HPHT diamond samples in previous research. When the concentration of the nitrogen is low, then the lifetime of this can be uh, much longer. But unfortunately, we don't have any experimental data currently. And we all know that the ele ele electronic state of nitrogen minus is close to the conduction band, but we don't know where exactly it is. There is a question that could the nitrogen minus get involved in the luminescence we observed in diamond? And in terms of the borum, uh, uh, at room temperature, most of the boron will sit in the neutral charge state and get, contributes to the beautiful blue color in diamond. And only a very small fraction of it will stay in the negative charge at room temperature. 
Boron is a well-known shallow acceptor whose energy level is just about 0.37 eV above the top of valence band. Uh, the FTIR spectrum gave us a good way to know the concentration of uh, substitutional boron neutral uh, by this 2803 uh, peaks. And also the cathode luminescence can give us the total, uh, con total concentration of the boron in both charge state. So what is phosphorescence? It is the emission of light which can decay after return of the light source. And it is a temperature dependent process. Uh, this model is an explanation for the phosphorescence in type two, high pressure and temperature, uh, which is published in 1997. And it is based on a recombination process. Bet uh, the charge transfer will happen between the donor and acceptor pairs uh, when they are both in neutral charge state and the light will emit. Um, during the optical excitation, that light is fluorescence. And after we turn off the light, we, we still got some uh, donor in neutral charge state and some acceptors in negative charge state the recombination is forbidden. At this time, there are some isolated minus uh, negative charge acceptor is able to release holes into the valence band by the thermal excitation. And it takes time to go through the valence band and retrapped by this defect and then the recombination can happen again and then generate emission of light. That is phosphorescence. We suggest that there is probability to have a shallow, a shallow, do sh shallow donor just above the conduction band, which is able to provide some electron to activate this recombination process. And it is noticeable that if this really exists, then each of the donor and accept acceptor pairs is able to uh, generate emission of light for many times. There are still some problems exist. For example, we don't know which impurity play an important uh, play roles as the donor uh, state. The secondly, as the temp uh, concentration of boron and nitrogen are both very low, so there is very low probability for them to form uh, closed pairs. So we also don't know the pro probability of nitrogen and the boron pairs. The secondly, the characteristic phosphorescence band in uh, type two synthet HPHD synthetic diamond is peak at 2.1 eV and 2.5 eV. It is not consistent with the isolated nitrogen neutral. And also, is there probability for other defects to get involved in this process? So we need experiments to understand the origin of the donor acceptor recombination in more detail. And here is the thermal luminescence. The mechanism of it is similar to the phosphorescence. So there are some electron traps and hole traps which is able to excite electron into the valence band or release holes into the, uh, sorry, to the conduction band and release holes to the valence band by thermal excitation. And the electron or holes is able to uh, act, uh, activate the some complex or donor and acceptor pairs to generate emission of light, which is thermal luminescence. Uh, each of the traps will give one peak in the TL glow curve. Here is our experimental setup. We are using the 224 UV laser as the optical excitation, and this is also replaceable to other different light source. The light is reflected by a mirror and goes through here to excite the diamond, which sits in a temperature controlling system, uh, 
controlling stage. The stage can vary temperature from 83 Kelvin to 873 Kelvin. The emission of light, such as photoluminescence, phosphorescence, and thermoluminescence, is able to collect by this parabolic mirror and finally detect by the camera or spectrometer. In terms of the phosphorescence experiment, uh, we are able to set a certain temperature we want by the Lincoln stage. After the temperature is stable, we are able to excite the example by the optical source. And just as we turn off the laser, we are able to start the camera or a spectrometer to detect the phosphorescence immediately. Uh, in terms of the thermal luminescence, firstly, we cooling down the sample to a very low temperature, which is 83 Kelvin. And when we hold at this temperature, we're doing the optical excitation. After that, we're heating up the sample, which we can see the sample glow, the thermal luminescence, and then we do the uh, detection. And some traps may have similar uh, electro energy energy energies, and so they may stick together. And there is a method called thermal cleaning process. We can uh, we can use this method to separate different traps. The way to doing that is to heating up the temperature just above the first peak, and then cooling down and we're heating it up to a higher uh, temperature, and then we empty the first trap so that we can separate different peaks. Here is our experimental data collected by the camera um, for the phosphorescence decay. And this decay curve is generally fitted by the combination of exponential function or the combination of hyperbolic function. And the hyperbolic function always fits better. For example, here is a, a three component hyperbolic function. Uh, we are able to see that this curve can be fit by the three very different component. Uh, in some, uh, sometimes two components is, can fit well and sometimes more more uh, components are required to get a satisfactory fitting. If we comp uh, see this residual, we are able to see that the three component fitting for this uh, curve is more reasonable than one or two components. And here is my samples. It, the uh, type two high pressure, high temperature diamond sample is cut into three different pieces by the growth sector. It is noticeable that even in the same growth sector, the t diamond is not homogeneous. In the sample one, which is the one mm growth sector, the boron neutral concentration is larger than the nitrogen neutral, and in the sample two, it is opposite. Uh, the different three components are labeled by different uh, color. They are black, red, and blue. At low and high temperature, there are only two components exist. And at immediate temperature, three components is required by the fitting. And we are able to see these two components decay fast and there is a long-lived component which will vary as huge as the temperature. Uh, and here is uh, the initial intensity of different components uh, in different samples. And we are able to plot the long uh, lifetime versus one over temperature to get this curve and do the linear fit to get the activation energy of the blue component, which is 0 0.35 EV. If you remember, it is quite close to the boron energy, uh, activation energy. Uh, but 
However, it is clear that as the temperature going down, the slope is going down too. <laughs> and here is our thermal luminescence result. We can see there is a unique peak with a shoulder on this glow curve, and then we can uh, split, separate these two peaks by the thermal cleaning process, and we got the activation energy of different traps, which is 0.33 EV and 0.37 EV, respectively. I have um, present um, my early experimental data for the phosphorescence and thermal luminescence um, and highlight the challenge we still meet. Definitely, there are still a lot of work to do to understand the phosphorescence in diamond. So in next year, we are going to do the time-resolved FDIR and EPR to see the change of these, the concentration of these two defects during the phosphorescence decay so we can understand more what role they are playing in this type of process. So I'm looking forward to see this. Thank you for listening. Question time. Very elegant talk, Luria. Uh, can you have any hypothesis as to what your donor state is in the phosphorescence? There is no certain evidence for it, but we are trying to see whether the nitrogen miners can be it. So further experiment is needed. <laughs> There was a report that a diamond of phosphorescence could be killed by uh, some irradiation process. How do you explain that from your model? Uh, so by w what type of irradiation? Like uh, irradiation. Um, what kind of defect is changed? What I heard from the report is uh, HPHD synthetic diamond with a very strong blue phosphorescence mm -hmm. after electron beam irradiation to whatever undiscoluted dosage or energy that a phosphorescence could be entirely killed. I have no idea about currently. Uh, I will see the report uh, you talked about and then I will go give you an answer. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much.